Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop on this second night of Faber Coblin. I'm happy to say that our OSHA non-compliance has come in and we are all systems go on the Janky Vent Mark III, which is a pressure regulated volume control. Goes to show the power of hive mindism and what one man can do in a moderately well equipped shop when you got a whole bunch of brainiacs telling them where to go and how to get there. Speaking of, a fella asked me if I knew where I could get these without giving uh, hand jobs out to machinists. I wish I knew, partner. I also got some actual technical requirements for uh, COVID emergency ARDS. Uh, and I meet all of the ventilation goals except for the optional ones with this janky setup. It, it, it's obviously too cheap to be commercially viable, but uh, if you're in a dilly of a pickle, it is doable. I did some research. Uh, a lot of you fellas told me to research the bird ventilator. This uh, smart fella bird was a World War II pilot, flew everything uh, with tits, wings, or wheels, and uh, he was flying back from Germany on a, on a bomber that was uh, ex freedomated, and he had found a uh, pressurized air regulator for breathing apparatus, which the U.S. didn't have, so he tore it down and then went on to invent a, uh, a mobile uh, pneumatic, uh, not pneumatics, well, what would you call that? Fluidics, microfluidics is a big thing now. You can move little dots of stuff around and, and do uh, blood tests and so forth. This would be macrofluidics, uh, essentially sim very simple hydraulics. And I had this in mind, clearly not going to replace any commercial units, not going to replace any manufactured units, but for home fabric cobbling, worst case scenario. I wanted to be able to service 80% of the ventilation needs. It ain't going to fix up uh, an 80-year-old smoker whose lungs have turned to a foamy, mucousy pink jelly. It, it, you're going to need a commercial unit to hook up to that one. But in this case, it does all of the requirements, albeit in a roundabout sort of way, that is required in this, uh, this brief. We'll go over them. Must have mandatory ventilation. Absolutely. I'll show you how we do that. Must be measured and displayed for volume control. It does that. It does uh, volume control. Optional. As soon as I see optional, gonzo. If it's optional, it's not a requirement. Okay. Uh, we need to have peak and plateau pressure displayed. There must be a mechanical fail safe that opens at 80. Uh, adjustable. Patient breathing must be right. Uh, peep, got to be uh, settable at all times. And the expiration ratio, that is the breathe out to breathe in ratio, has got to be adjustable between one to one and one to three. Absolutely. Uh, the amount of breaths we take, absolutely. We got that. Must have uh, the volume setting. We got all that. All of this stuff, incoming gas, we don't have any of that stuff. However, speaking of gas, most... <laughs> this is where I insert a fart joke normally, but this is serious business here. Most hospitals have air at 50 PSI, clean air, compressed air at 50 PSI bedside, and they also have oxygen. And apparently the oxygen is simply metered with a typical flow control valve like Zo, and they're not too worried about uh, wasting it at all. They just flow it right into the bag there, no big deal. Oh, well, here's the typical embodiment. We have a pressure reducing valve, air in, pressure reducing valve, a needle valve. We just have a gauge here just for close proximity to see what's going on. And what we do is we set this so that it fills a bladder over here and this is closed loop here because as the bladder expands we come over here to a manometer manometer <laughs> manometer so we can set the amount of tidal volume by 
monitoring how high the manometer rises, okay? And then what we do is once that fluid hits a certain level, it triggers a float switch or a level sensor. That level sensor sends a pulse to a triple nipple timer. Nickel timer, boobies on the brain. That triple nickel timer sends a pulse to a solenoid valve, which is a zero drop solenoid valve. In place here, we have just a manual valve because it takes a while for the supply chain to get this stuff to me. And we exhaust through this manometer and depending on the level of fluid in here, we get a certain amount of back pressure. So this is what allows us to set our peep. Uh, it's the reading and it's also a fail safe max pressure. So depending on how much fluid you have in here, you have a max pressure of however many centimeters of water. The peak pressure and the platen pressure, we don't set it, but we monitor it here. So all we got to do, these are all manometers. So these are the visual readout, the visual feedback for all of these systems. Manometer one, manometer two, manometer three. I'm gonna run you through the series of operation and the most persnicketyest part of it is setting the tidal volume. I was gonna say tidal bore. I got uh, the proper medical grade HPHT on there. That's high, hot pink hockey tape, as well as the peak pressure. So what you gotta do is you gotta hit the sweet spot. You fill this tube up to where you figure out how much volume your patient needs. So say it's 300 milliliters. Then you gotta fill this tube so that at 300 milliliters of volume, you can see it's at zero, it'll grow at 300 milliliters of volume. You also want to hit your pressure, what you're looking for. So if you need 60 centimeters of water pressure and you want 300 milliliters of air in there, you're going to need to fill it to about here so that when you're ready for the uh, respiration inlet, you're sitting right here. And then what you do is you set up your float switch so that it triggers at this 60 millimeter level. That's the finickiest part of the whole operation. We got to go fairly easy. We got uh, our patient here, one lung dung. He's going to only have 300 milliliters and at 30 cm of peak pressure. I'm going to slow the sequence right down to show you what's going on. This is the respiration rate control. This is just a, a needle valve. And what that does is it fills that bladder up, which brings this guy up, which triggers the float switch, which triggers the 555 timer, which fires the solenoids. And what we can do is these triple nickels uh, control the um, ER. That is, you're supposed to exhale for longer than you inhale. So we can set all that up. The, the requirement, according to the UK document there, was between one to one and one to three. And we can do that. It's also automatically in mandatory mode. We can give an additional demand spontaneous mode control by having some additional uh, circuit on this float switch and have plumbing in so that when the patient breathes in, it drops the pressure in here, drops the level a little bit. And that's how we get our signaling to know to take a breath. That's future iterations. But for now, we're strictly in mandatory mode. I'm going to run a real slow and show you exactly how this uh, control sequence works. Oh, once we get to 300 milliliters and 30 cm ahead pressure, this will actuate a little bit beyond there, but that's okay. And the triple nickel timer actuates this valve, fires this valve, opens up. We inflate the lung. The pressure drops back down. That gives the low signal. We're running into trouble because the fluid we're using is too viscous for the size of tube. We're using water. We need to have um, either less viscous like alcohol. I wouldn't want to waste alcohol in a time like this. 
what we need to do is go to the hardware store, which I'm not supposed to do for other than critical issues. And um, we need bigger tubing so that it doesn't do this gurgle and cheech. We, we don't want, we're not making a bong here. So the bladder has given the lung its designated air charge. And now we need to cycle this. So the triple nickel timers would close this valve and then open the expire valve, uh, expire, what would you call that? Breathe out. And we can see it maintains pressure, back pressure, whatever we set in here, what, however much fluid we put in there, that's the back pressure. Huh? We can make it, give it more back pressure. So this either needs to be a bigger tube or it needs to have some bulbous affixation so that it allows the, the fluid to not intermingle with the, um, or the liquid to not intermingle with the gas and allows the gas to get out. Future iterations aside, it works in practice. Does it work in theory? That I leave it to you. We got, obviously this is not this manometer. Uh, we need, gotta do something about that. That's no fucking good at all.